All right. So, hi, I'm Julian Lang, and I am here in uh, McKinleyville, and uh, up in northwestern California, uh, the local river that we have here is called the Patawa in um, the Wiat language. Uh, this is the upper end of the Wiat territory, and then there's a Wiat, which is the the the, the uh, Humboldt Bay, and then uh, not Wiat, no Wiki is the is the Humboldt Bay, and Wiat is the Eel River, and so it's one part of the whole system of all the rivers that we have up here in northwestern California, and this is um, Wiat land. Uh, there's so much to talk about. What, where could we possibly begin? And um, I'm a member of the Karuk tribe. And the Karuk tribe is a, a Hokan speaking people uh, upriver, uh, about 60 miles up the, the, um, the Klamath River. Our boundary is at Bluff Creek. And from Bluff Creek, you go all the way up the river up to the Syad uh, Valley, which is, I don't know, 80 miles, I think, up the, up the Klamath River. And included on that river is the Salmon River and lots and lots of uh, major streams and creeks and all of that that feed as tributaries into the Klamath. And uh, so that it's our land, Nanuthivthanen, we call it. Um, uh, I've been doing a lot of language teaching in the last number of years, 20 years, 30 years actually, but uh, really uh, have gotten into uh, trying to help in the process of creating new speakers. It's our new mantra is not to learn your language, but to become a speaker and to create new speakers. That's our goal. And, there, and it's connected with this idea of environment. And it's in, connected with this idea that we're, we're discussing today, this idea of salmon, and the water, and all of that. Uh, it's uh, what, I, what I've been uh, saying lately is that the, our language is the key that opens the door uh, and beyond that door is an indigenous consciousness, or the, uh, an indigenous worldview. So this first picture, for instance, uh, represents that, everything that we are. And um, so actually, I guess we did, we, we reverse the slide. I wonder if we can go to the slide two then. Yeah. Oh, no, slide three. There, that one. So this is the center of the world at high water in, the, in, in winter time. This is uh, uh, the whole area, the center of the photo there is uh, what we call Katimin, Ba'in, and that is the falls. And it's now totally inundated with the river. Uh, the mountain to the left there is called Auliach, and that is a uh, the one, the, the, the mountain who is above us and it overlooks and is a protector for Katami. And we say that that person was uh, once a man. And when they were, the, our belief is that we have spirits that, wrote, that lived here in this world before the human beings arrived. And that, that person decided to become this mountain rather than leave the, the earth and go across the ocean, this land and go across the ocean to, um, to the spirit world, we call it. And uh, so he, he decided that he would stay here and he would stand up above, uh, up, up above. And then he decided, well, what will the human beings do? So this person, this mountain taught us everything to live from, fishing, hunting, all of our livelihood comes from this mountain. So that's very, very important uh, to our cultural uh, understanding of our relationship between the human being and the land. 
that this is all one place. Now if we go back to the first um, photo again. So here is uh, the, uh, the same place uh, at, at, uh, at more normal late fall flows. And if you look at the very, very center, you can't really see it very well, but there's a flat rock down there, um, right in the very middle of the photograph. And that flat rock just off the, off the uh, river there, that is the place where the fishermen go. So this here is called the Imwid, the Eid, and it's where uh, all the salmon uh, for the people is, is caught. Uh, families had fisheries all along the, the Klamath River, but this place was the people's uh, Eid and it was owned and operated by and for the Indian people, kind of people at Katumi. And, and it was owned by uh, days. So each day was separated into morning and afternoon. And so uh, you had rights, your family had rights to fish at these places during the morning and during the afternoon. And uh, so uh, family, it was very important because you would catch enough salmon at that point to, to uh, for your whole family for the year, and also to be able to provide for other families who were not able uh, to, uh, or who did not have that fishing right. And, and then, uh, for example, in the Second World War, uh, my grandmother's uncle, uh, uh, Uncle John, Johnny Pepper, was uh, one of the only able-bodied men that was still around at that time. He was an older man, but um, he was able to uh, go. So he inherited all of these fishing rights uh, for these days. So every family, they would say, this is, you, you fish for me, I have these, this, this, these time, and they would go down and fish for the people. And uh, then the fishermen would would uh, divvy up the fish to the uh, to the uh, fish owner, the fish day owner. We call them fish days. And so there's a very very important place. Okay, now we can go to that the next uh, slide. Yeah, this is the downriver edge. This is Asanam Kada. Um, this is Yutdimin. So the downriver. Uh, falls. And this here is at Ike's Flat, it's on the left there. And on the right is Amekiadam. And Amekiadam is where we say that the salmon came from, where they, when the, when the human beings arrived, this is where salmon was, was uh, actually being uh, kept. And, um, and Lynn had uh, uh, did a, a big painting with uh, high school students, which which she'll show you later, which uh, which talks of this place and the creation story associated with it. Ame kiada means am means salmon, and ikiada means um, where it is made or the place that it is made. And so ame ame kiada is uh, is uh, the site of the um, what they call the uh, mountain dance. And um, uh, the jump dance uh, held a 10-day uh, world renewal ceremony. And so this is a very important place. And it's all within, you know, pretty much shouting distance. Not really, but I mean, it's like within the, a mile of each, each. Each place is located, like, say, a mile apart. And so this is on the Klamath River, a uh, little place called Soms Bar very small little place, 250 people are there when everybody's home. And uh, so it's a, it's a small but very powerful place. And I think that's one of the important things that native people can teach society is that you know, your centers are sacred places and should only be, it should not be populated but like, you know, like the cities are these days. You know, these places are sacred and they need to remain natural. They, they should not be converted into, you know, properties for, you know, um, with values going through the sky and all of this kind of stuff. So anyway, I just want, wanted to kind of start with those and then we can move on with our photos. 
uh, I wanted to show. So this is a, a photograph of of a, of a couple at Kadamin. I, I, this here happens to be at um, at a place called Everell's Field, uh, which is just above Kadamin. And uh, I wanted to show it because it kind of represents that first human, the first uh, the first human being, the first couple, and how human beings came into this world. That they came in with the idea that uh, they were agreeing to live by the laws that were contained and passed on in these things called our stories, our creation stories, Pikwa. The Pikwa are in that contains everything that we need. The Pikwa uh, are very, are the stories. And then associated with that is the Anna or the medicine formula that is also a basis. So the Pikwa tells us the story of how it all happened, but then the um, the Anna tells us how it was used and how to harness the power of um, the ikade of that is being talked about in that Pikwa. So they had a process. So they were able to say, this is their story. And now this is the process that they lined out for us to be able to harness that. And it includes everything from the, um, the salmon, the idea of the salmon being a man or a woman, uh, that they, um, uh, when they were released at Amekyaram from that house at Amekyaram, the salmon went down and they say at the mouth, the man is on one side of the river and the, and the woman is at the other side of the river. And that uh, the man is kind of more in vigil, is in vigil kind of ho ho uh, holding, uh, protecting, and the, the woman is the one who calls them in. So during the Sabbath runs, that this is the one that says, okay, now, and then they come and they, the runs begin. And that's where all the anadromous uh, fish on the clamor. So anyway, and go uh, connect, go, go forward. So uh, art is uh, is a very, uh, for me, it's been, you know, pretty much a lifestyle. I've been, uh, I make as much money as I need to exist and, and uh, live. And then, uh, you know, I try to, but in the process, create as much time as I can in, cre in creating artwork. And um, and my artwork has changed over the years. It evolves. It goes one extreme to the next. But you could say I'm kind of an extremist, but uh, in a good way, not in a too much in a bad way, <laughs> hopefully. And uh, uh, go ahead and change. So this is one example of, of, of a work that uh, recent, fairly recent work, I think from last year and the last uh, beginning of last year, I think. And uh, it represents a, where this is the word that the Ikade of ask, where to where have you all gone? Because they, um, it's the human beings. It, uh, this is the recurring theme is that the human, we are the human being and we are not nature in the sense that that um, nature is free. Nature, and that is the role of the human being to keep nature free. Uh, that's our job, you know, that's our job is to, you know, pro to really promote uh, the diversity in the world, the natural biological uh, diversity in the world. That's our job, that's what we're here for. And that we, and the idea of creating freedom for nature to prosper and to just uh, be, be itself. Uh, the nature needs to be free. And then the human beings, we will be, uh, we are the ones that require laws, that we're the ones that are, that are bound by laws uh, to uh, maintain that relationship with the nature. That's our. That's the way they they set it up. That human beings will always need to have laws because, you know, of these things called greed, which we've seen a lot of that lately, 
uh, because of these things called, uh, you know, uh, I guess, I don't know, avarice and, you know, uh, pride, you know, pride, all these different things that humans end up feeling. And so uh, that's why it's really important that, that our main God and our main principle is, is the nature of our land, of who we are where we live, where we come from. That is the one who is um, in, in charge. And we think of it in terms of a man and a woman that you know everything comes in pairs as a man and a woman. And each has its role within that natural, uh, within that particular you know, natural world idea. So who got hit up what to where have you gone? Because we say that the, they all left, the, the spirits of the world left at one point. And uh, when we ask for their help, that's what we're saying, where did you guys go? And then they will reveal to us their location on this land, if they're still here or wherever they are. And then we can pray to them and they will guide us, they will give us and all of that. Okay, next slide. So uh, the idea of resistance, the idea of political, the idea of uh, legal, um, these are all um, kind of modern, um, modern dilemmas that uh, did not exist. It's kind of like being invaded, which is what we are. Uh, colonial, the colonial, um, uh, boot uh, is still pretty much uh, hanging over us in many places, some places it's right, the boot's right on our necks. And so, but um, uh, the idea of resistance and um, uh, activistic kinds of uh, active, you know, resistance and, and protest and uh, and uh, is really an important uh, part of who we are today. Uh, if we are to fulfill our role as human beings. And if we don't care about that, then maybe this isn't as important. But if we want to be a human being, if we want to be the kind of person that, um, that we, we, we were told was the ideal person, the human being that, um, that would be protective of nature, that would be um, a believer in all of these uh, things called culture, then um, uh, in a way this represents us. So who is it? It's Crane, the, um, the idea of no dapple. Um, there's a song that we kind of created. There's a song uh, in our language of the crane and the crane is a funny person because he's a fisherman. And so he walks along the shores and, he's, and he catches fish periodically and whatever is in along the shore. And, um, and his song is real funny. He goes, so he says that uh, uh, I am um, I am alive. I live because of frogs. He said, if it wasn't for those frogs, I wouldn't be around anymore. And so, um, so we adapted that during this the Dakota Pipeline um, uh, period uh, uh, back on the plains. What's that been? Almost two years ago by now. And uh, recent, you know. Uh, they it finally got shut down and they said, so it's been really great. So Crane's a pretty powerful person if 
if we think about it that you know because we adapted his song and we said uh it's because of water that i am alive as a human being so we were able to kind of take that um traditional song and uh and be create a new way of looking at um at our uh, our activism that we're just being ourselves we're not trying to be anybody else you know we're not trying to be uh leaders of this and that you know we're gonna be home i mean we're gonna we're home bodies so, uh, if you think about it I, in northwestern california i think we're all pretty much home bodies and that's you know the, the way we are so uh next slide hopefully i'm not gone too far over time uh, this here is another painting that I uh, recently did. Um, uh, it represents, um, it was a steelhead, uh, uh, a call for art to uh, create steelhead, uh, uh, something representing steelhead. So, you know, as I was thinking, um, I have a, uh, my painting process is to just bomb a canvas with color, could be one color, a couple of colors, uh, and just kind of smoosh it all, uh, all around. And then stand back and look and see what story is in there that's trying to come out. And so I do, 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 do it that way. And I did it. So in the far, far back, you can see some different um, colors, ground colors. And, um, and suddenly, uh, and I got all of these, uh, there's a local uh, photographer who uh, does a lot of underwater um, photography of uh, anadromous fish, salmon, steelhead, and sturgeon, eels, and all of that. And um, so I was watching those and, you know, and I was just having a really hard time. How do you be so literal, you know, uh, preserving, protecting the water and the land and all that. How can you be so literal? I have a hard time doing that. Some people are really graphically strong, like Lynn, you'll find out later. Uh, uh, she's able to take a lot of different ideas like that and combine them in, in, a, in a really clear graphic way. I tend to kind of, I, I tend to think, I don't know how I think really, to be honest. And, uh, but, so this is what happened. So um, the, the steelhead and salmon have this kind of, a, it's a really light red line along the length of their body. So the first thing that really happened was that red circle. And so I, I, just, I just did it. I had no clue what I was doing. So, and I went, oh, that is the sign. That's, a, uh, that's that line on the side of the fish. And, um, and it's kind of that that color, and so based on that, everything just kind of came together, and it just within you know a day or two it was done, and it kind of combines all of those things: the depth of the water, the the flow, the the interconnectedness, and all of that. And so anyway, that's kind of uh, was my submission for that um, particular um, uh, call for art. Let's see, is there another? And then finally, uh, I work a lot with youth, and I think that's kind of one of the um, the great things. I guess uh, you know, I said with when it comes to language, our goal is to create new speakers. And in working with youth, the goal is creating new uh, human beings. And so uh, working with youth, we've done lots of things. In fact, where Kateri had previously worked in their, um, their kind of break room, or I don't know what that room was that was off on the, not on the side you were on, but on the other side, the long room there, conference room of some sort. Anyway, we would go in there and we used to do uh, youth programs for years. And uh, one of the things we would do is periodically is pull out a big piece of, of uh, canvas and then create this, um, create these um, canvases, uh, paintings. And so one was because it's sacred. So this is a, uh, 
I don't know. I think they're, they were all under 18, and I think there were maybe eight was the, the youngest that they were, uh, all these youth. And then so we painted this thing. And so because it's sacred, and that was one of the things about the river, uh, why is it sacred? It's because it is sacred. It is sacred. It's a sacred thing, the water. And, um, and then surrounded around that is the human beings and our relationship with it. Nature, and then how each of us as human beings are connected with, uh, with that nature as well. So anyway, there's all but done by a bunch of kids. And it was like, wow, that's really nice. You guys did it fantastic job so um, I don't know why the ear is down there but uh, I guess you have to listen too so I'm ready now to listen to other folks and um, so I thank you very much uh, um, Brittany to um, uh, for inviting me uh, to this there's a bunch of other things um, I wanted to leave, end with this this is one of our youth that we've been working with and uh, Zoe uh, so this was her first ceremony in a, in a, in a way. I don't know if she had uh, danced with the Talmuds or not yet, but uh, this was at Chopek a no number of years ago. And uh, um, it was all, everybody had finished up and everybody was sitting and getting ready to pack up and go home um, because the ceremony is just that. Uh, you could see some of the other youth up on the right hand corner up there. Um, this was uh, people from the river schools. This is uh, the Sa uh, Klamath and uh, Salmon River schools. Uh, they, they would have periodic um, gatherings on the Salmon River in this case. And uh, we would, uh, you know, tell them stories and, and try to uh, give some kind of value, uh, uh, cultural knowledge, uh, pass it on to uh, all the young people. So that's a really, I think where we are now is really working with youth and language and connecting them with that vast body of knowledge uh, known as Indian, uh, Indian culture and Indian law. So thank you very much. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Lynn to um, give her presentation and talk. So Lynn, are you ready? Uh, yes. Great. Let me be sure I get this right. Okay, there you go. So Ayuki Kowoda, Nanatui Lynn Risling, Na, I'm a member of the Hupa tribe and a descendant of the Karuk and Yurok people. And um, like Julian said, where do you start? Um, I never thought, like Kateri, I never think of myself as an activist so much, but an artist I am. And, you know, other things, my grandmother now. And, um, but when I started thinking about it and looking back on my life, I realized, well, I was born in a family of activists, starting with my grandfather, who did many things to help our, you know, our people, his people, through education, through, um, you know, trying to bring back culture and all these different things. And it filtered down through his children and his grandchildren. And I'm thankful for that experience, those experiences in growing up. And what I learned, not just from him, but other relatives, um, aunts that were basket weavers and also contemporary artists. And um, there was a time when it was hard to gather materials for baskets. And so my aunt and some of her sisters and other women started a pottery guild and they used natural um, clay from our area, even though traditionally our ancestors were not potters, but they started doing pottery using the native clay and incorporating the basket designs onto the pottery because at that time there wasn't very many people still weaving and it was hard to get materials. 
but then that changed later on when my aunt um, decided we needed to have our uh, basket classes. And so um, she was able with others to get that started and then started making other types of jewelry using traditional materials and incorporating baskets, basket medallions in that and kind of started this whole, whole um, art form more of a contemporary, you might say, art form uh, that's gone continued on today, and it's actually grown throughout California. So there's a lot of people that are um, doing this type of art form using traditional um, items. So um, anyway, my father was an activist in on a lot of different levels, both um, you know locally as well as nationally especially in Indian education and so I was surrounded by these people and influenced my my life in a lot of ways but also there was um, through that there was activism going on like when I first started college in the early um, well it was late 60s early 70s that's the time of the civil rights and then um, a lot of other things came from that, including, um, you know, the Native people with American Indian Movement and Alcatraz and many other things. And uh, my father was involved in getting a university started, uh, all Indian university at, uh, in Davis called DQU. Um, so there are many things going around, uh, around me that influenced my life, but I was an artist at heart. And when I started college, I wanted to study a lot of different things. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I ended up in art. And one of the people that uh, was an influence on me was a, a Navajo artist who was a teacher. I took a, a couple classes from him, you know, and I was at that time, I was just learning a lot of different things about art, but he um, motivated me and um, inspired me to do art that was related to my own culture and my own um, Indian identity. And that's kind of where I took off as far as art um, it, in the direction that it has grown and become and who I am now as an artist. And um, this piece, this is moving forward, you know, many years ahead. I had an opportunity um, to teach a class at McKinleyville High with Native students and through a grant through the Humboldt Area Foundation locally. And um, so I got this grant to do a collaborative piece with people in the community. And so I chose to work with these students at McKinleyville High and I chose the theme of salmon as um, to, um, to teach art. So it was a regular art class, but I, I chose salmon as a theme. So we started out with, um, um, well, this piece isn't with from, that the students did, but this was um, that process of working with those students was kind of an inspiration for me to really look at the importance of salmon in our tribal people's lives, not just traditionally, but today. And so um, this was one of the pieces that, that I did myself. And I'll, I'll get to the other um, pieces that I did with students. But this one here, Swim Up the River, um, has a little short poem. It's called Swim Up the River, um, Don't Go With the Flow. But, um, Let's see, swim up the river, don't go with the flow. Um, we'll find our way home again, it's not far to go. So this piece was about, of course, the salmon going up to their spawning grounds, but it was also about us as human beings that sometimes we have to swim against the river, swim against the current um, in order to do the right thing, that we have to stand up for what we believe in and do the right thing in terms of our environment and taking care of the world and the earth. Um, so that's what this one is about. So uh, you can change it to the next one. This represents the uh, Klamath River that Julian showed some photographs um, of, and it's called Chemyach Ik Ishiat. And it's a, it's a 
part of a prayer that is um, told at the end of our traditional stories during the winter time. And it has to do with um, bringing uh, or praying for the salmon to return in the spring. And the, the stories were told during the winter time. And so, um, you know, it made sense like during the winter time when we don't have the salmon running and we don't have all the resources available as far as food that uh, it was really important to ensure that we have the return of the salmon in our rivers because of salmon was, you know, one of our main sources of food. And we also did ceremonies as Julian mentioned and um, Kateri um, in regards to the jump dance. And we also have a ceremony called the white deerskin dance, which is, those are both considered world renewal ceremonies to bring back balance into the world, to give thanks for all the things that the earth has provided in the past year or, or a couple of years and to pray that we have a future um, of resources with the waters, the river, the salmon, and all the life that the rivers give. And the deer represents the really the spiritual realm, but it also connects us to the earth and reminds us that we are connected to both the spiritual world above us and the earth below us and that we are part of it all, it's all connected. So I can go on to the next. Julian mentioned a story about how the salmon came to be and they're at the place at Ame Kiaram and how the salmon um, in the story that um, there were two old women that were hiding the salmon underneath their house in the water below their house. And so all the uh, uh, beings below did not have the salmon and, and Coyote had, had learned about these women. So he, I'm not gonna do the old story, but he was able to trick them and release all the salmon from underneath the house into the rivers. And this is a piece I did with the students at McKinleyville High. They painted all the salmon sitting at their desk and then we uh, glued the salmon onto the piece, but they also were involved in painting the whole, the whole piece. And this was a six by six foot panel. And we did four of them during that year. Um, and, and again, it was a whole um, year of the, the theme was about the salmon and the importance of the salmon to our ancestors and then um, bringing up bringing us to the current time. It also included a piece that I didn't, um, that's not part of this PowerPoint, but it um, shows the traditional uh, methods of salmon uh, fishing that our ancestors did and also up into the present day of gill net fishing. And also um, a ceremony we call the first salmon ceremony that would happen um, with all of the tribes in our area, the Hupa, the Yurok, the Karu, um, did a salmon ceremony to um, bring back the salmon um, at the beginning of the salmon runs in the, in the spring. And um, so it was a very sacred ceremony as we were all, I guess I've all mentioned the sacredness of the waters of the rivers and of the um, of the salmon to our people. The, these are all, the, this is the life force of our people, this, these rivers and the life that it provides for our people. Okay, the next. This was another one we did about the life cycle of the salmon from the spawning fish in the corner in the right. <coughs> laying the eggs and then all the stages of the salmon as they're growing and eventually moving, swimming um, down the river to the mouth of the river, of uh, the Klamath River and going into the estuary where they um, get acclimated to the water, the two fresh water and the salt water mixed um, in the estuary and then they eventually swim out into the ocean and they remain there from five to seven years before they 
come back to their original spawning ground at different um, places on the river. Um, each, each fish knows where to go. So it's pretty amazing. Okay. And this was also another piece we did. Again, they're like six feet by six feet canvas panels. And this was um, to show what's been going on more recently concerning our salmon and the issues around the water and the dams that are on the river, Klamath River throughout the Klamath River Basin um, that goes from the Northern California up into the lower part of um, Oregon. And this was in 2006 and seven. And during that time, there was um, some hearings going on regarding the removal of the dams um, on, the, on the Klamath River. And this, these are issues that are still going on today and haven't been totally resolved. We still have the dams and there's been um, legislation passed to remove the dams, but it takes money and it takes a, a government um, effort as well as a lot of other people to do that. So we're still waiting for that to happen. But um, this is a very educational moment for not only the students, but for myself. Um, a couple of students and myself went to one of the hearings. And so the issues had to do with um, you know, our tribal sovereignty and fishing rights and water rights, but there we were up against um, farmers uh, in um, Oregon that are um, using the water, same water source for um, farming, um, and then the commercial fishermen. So there was different people that have a stake in this water. And during that year of 2002, there was a big fish kill that happened on the rivers, uh, on the Klamath River, um, that had to do with warm temperatures from, from drought and also this parasite that grows, um, that really grows a lot during warm, when a temperature rises. And then because of the dams, the, the low, also the low water, um, you know, levels. And so that combination created this large, large um, fish kill. And then of course, other um, the farmers also um, wanting that water for their farming. So anyway, it was a very, um, educational experience for all of us and brought awareness to us, uh, me more uh, so than I had in the past. And, uh, you know, something looking at the water and looking, you know, cause I grew up with salmon like many of us did. And, and you know, you kind of take it for granted that it'll always be there, but it, we can't take it for granted. Okay. This is just, uh, a painting I did, you know, having to do with salmon and the salmon returning to their spawning ground. Okay. This is a piece I did um, that has to do with the same issues around salmon and swimming against the current, like I mentioned in the other piece that I did. And in the lower right hand corner, different kinds of industry um, that affect our environment from the oil um, extraction and industry to the uranium um, nuclear power plants and the uh, um, dams on the, on the rivers and how the, the devastation, the effect it ha can have on our waters, our rivers, our salmon and other life source, um, sources that are in the rivers and that we are connected in this way to the salmon. You know, it's kind of like they're, the salmon are like the canary in the cave. You know, what happens to them affects our lives. And so in the center is the, the fetus of a human being as well as the eggs of a salmon. So, you know, we're connected in this way and we, one affects the other. What we do affects the, the water, the health of the water, the rivers and the salmon and their lives affect ours because they have given us and still do, you know, as a food source and beyond. Okay. 
this was a response to what was happening in um, South North Dakota at Standing Rock. And um, that Julian had a piece that had also to do with this. But, you know, it's uh, something that affects, even though it was far away, it, it has, it affects all of us indigenous people. And it was a really good time to educate a lot of youth and tribal people from all over. There was people that went there from California and from our area, tribal people that went there to stand with the native people there. Uh, to, and to uh, there was families that went and cooked for people and people that, you know, gave sacrifice and stayed there a long time from different tribes and different, not just tribal people, but others as well but it brought a lot of awareness. And just recently there was, um, I don't know what the, all the technical or all the details about it, but there right now that there has been a stop to that um, pipeline temporary, at least temporarily. And as well as I think two, uh, two or three others in the United States and beyond maybe. Um, so, um, you know, there, there's, there was a huge impact um, what, by those people standing up for what they believed in because it's so important to their life, the water and the effect of these pipelines on our water sources. And that's throughout the United States and Canada and probably beyond that. So it's really important to um, educate ourselves, to become aware and to um, stand up for these, the rights of the water and okay. Um, this is a piece I did for a California um, Indian conference that took place at Humboldt State University. And, um, you know, it has to do with family and, you know, our, our ancestors and the relationship that we have to the world around us, to our environment, to the wildlife and to the water and to the food sources that the earth has provided for us. And to um, that we are a living people that have a living culture that still is part of us today that we nurture and we value as sacred and um, you know, there's many of us who are, have been involved, um, like my family, for probably 45 years or so in cultural revitalization um, that I feel a privilege to have been a part and continue to be a part in re revitalizing our ceremonies, such as our flower dance ceremonies, which is a girl's puberty ceremony um, for our young uh, women that's... Um, we had, we um, were able to bring back, Julia and I were kind of instrumental in getting that started for the Karuk um, peoples. We've since 1996, when my daughter um, was coming of age and another friend of ours, Kim Moon. And we were able to, after much research and, and uh, making regalia and many, many other things, um, language included um, prayers and a lot of things of trying to revitalize a ceremony that hadn't taken place for over 120 years and where we didn't have living people to be able to um, give us a map of what to follow that we had to, to um, do that on our own. And we were able to do that and we are continuing to do that ceremony today. And since that time, um, uh, the tribes, the local tribes in the area, besides the Karuk, the Hupa, the Yurok, the uh, Talawa, um, the Sanangwe, the, the, I want to mention that the Talawa had their, the same, I think the year before we did. Um, but anyway, that's been a beautiful thing, and as well as other ceremonies that have continued to be um, flourish with many efforts from many people throughout the years that in bringing these ceremonies back. And it's wonderful to see young people being involved and um, people not only singing songs from our ancestors, but creating new songs. And um, people like Kateria that are 
weavers, you know, like our ancestors that are teaching, you know, young people um, to become involved in their culture. Um, I feel that being involved in culture is a form of activism. So I say to Kateri, you are definitely an activist. And, um, you know, anyone that, you know, takes up their culture and teaching others and for our children, our grandchildren and our future generations, you're activists. And our ancestors were activists in resisting in, in surviving all the things they had to survive, whatever they had to do, you know, and each, each generation evolves and, and rises up to the, whatever's going on, the changes that need to happen. Um, and part of that is culture and taking care of our environment, our waters, and we have to uh, learn our histories, know our histories, so we know what our ancestors went through, what they did, and how their spirit is what kept them going, the spirit of the land, you know, the spirit of the earth, that's where their strength comes from. And that's the strength that we have, that we can continue on to, um, you know, to continue with who we are and our culture. Okay. And this was a piece I did last summer uh, that's at Humboldt State University. It was a grant through Native American Studies. Um, Kutcha, I want to say thank you to Kutcha Rizling Baldi because she had, a, um, I believe she was the one that wrote the grant. And um, there is a building called the Native Forum on campus that um, was built uh, somewhat like a traditional, or at least to look on the outside, like a traditional house, as you can see in the picture and um, on the lower right-hand side, um, traditional native house from our area. And anyway, there's a lobby area in the back of this, this building, which is a, then the forum is a gathering place where they have whole classes as well as other events, especially native uh, people coming together from not only on campus from but from the community and beyond and that's where the conference was held that I mentioned earlier earlier the California Indian conference and anyway in the lobby um, they wanted to um, create a space that educates people to the people of our area um, of Northern California who we are and um, educate the people that are on campus the students that are coming to campus and others. Um, and so in the middle is a, is a map of Northern California. I wanted to show some of the tribal territories, uh, uh, traditional uh, Aboriginal territories of our peoples um, in Northern California um, and the languages that um, the word for people in our different tribes. Um, so it has the name of a tribe, let's say, Karuk, but it also has the, um, our traditional word for people, Adad. So um, I wanted to use our some of our languages to show that and then um, show how we are connected to our environment, to the mountains, the rivers, the ocean. And uh, then we have, I wanted to show some of our, the culture through our ceremonies and our basket weaving and um, some of the other things that are important to us. The uh, wildlife, um, there's the eagle on one side and our woodpecker on one side. And then in the middle is the condor. And the, I wanna mention the condor because the condor is returning. Uh, the Yurok tribe has put in a lot of effort to make this happen. Um, over the last several years to bring back the condor to our area, which has was almost extinct in California, the California condor. Um, and then there were efforts made um, in different parts, especially in Southern California to bring those back. So um, anyway, um, I know I'm running out of time. So I think that's just about it.